Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the second episode of the Google Cloud Data User Group. My name is Imran Hussein. I'm Neil Strange. And it's our pleasure to welcome all of you to Uh, three weeks on from our previous uh, session. I hope everyone is keeping well and safe. Um, as always, let's start with some housekeeping. We'll be aiming to wrap up within the hour. We'll be using Slido again to run some polls and to take questions. So feel free to ask questions right through the session and we'll try our best to get through them as we, as we go along. Um, and um, let's try and make this as engaging as possible for everybody. Before we kick off, uh, we're using the same link as last time, uh, Slido. Here's the link and the event code. I suggest everyone logs in, has a window open, so we're ready to go. The session is being recorded, and as per the, as, as, as per the last session, we will be posting it on the YouTube channel. Um, and as always, I recommend uh, that we all subscribe. I'll get my trusty hand back out again, subscribe. Uh, some great talks coming over the next uh, few weeks. We have um, CICD on Airflow um, on the 18th, I believe, and a really interesting talk on Big Table coming soon after that. Don't miss any of them. In terms of today's agenda, a great agenda today um, around data world, a data warehousing methodology that's creating a real buzz in the data world. We're very fortunate to be joined by Neil Strange. So Neil is an, is an acknowledged expert in the Data Vault methodology and is one of UK's leading evangelists for Data Vault. In fact, he chairs his own meetup group in London, um, the Data Vault meetup group, which I highly recommend for anybody who's really interested. In We've got one on the 9th of June coming up. So um, uh, please check out our meetup and come and join us. We've got John Giles presenting. He's a renowned expert on Agile, um, Agile, uh, 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 Agile um, uh, data modeling and uh, starting off projects with with analytics so he's worth uh, well worth listening to sorry jumping in there go ahead <laughs> no no worries feel free anytime so uh highly recommended i've been to a few and uh they're, they're, they're great uh, evenings when they were in person but i'm sure the meet online ones will be great as well so neil's been neil has vast experience in, in implementing data warehouses um he was previously a director in arthur anderson's consulting division okay. and in terms of his data warehousing experience it's literally vast across multiple industries and um, and uh, use cases. As always, we'll be wrapping up with the Q&A at the end. Um, so please, again, feel free to ask questions as they, as, uh, as they arise. And uh, we're making a bit of a tradition on this by um, doing some polls. So I'm going to do, I'm going to run with that and um, go over to one, which is over here. And great, people are already in there. So the first question, actually, my bad. <laughs> well, the first question is understanding a bit more about all of you. Um, and that is which role best describes what you do. And that would be great to get a feel of the audience, see where everyone is coming from. We'll give um, give everybody a few minutes to, to um, make their minds up as to who they are. So we have uh, a couple of responses. Uh, data engineers leading, data analysts coming behind. Okay, some more activity um, going on. Data engineers still leading, but uh, neck and neck with, uh, followed by other, lots of others. And, um, data leads. Great. Neil, how does that how does that compare to the kind of audience you normally have? It's pretty good, actually, yeah. Um, good to see data engineers out there at the moment. Um, we do a lot of the donkey work, getting the data ready for, for the business. So um, we'll talk a bit about uh, how the data engineering pipeline works in, in the data world. Great. So definitely things to say to the other roles that are there. 
Um, okay. I don't know who the others are. <laughs> are they in the right uh, in the right meetup? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they are. There's a, there's a sizable one, a sizable portion yeah. of them. So thank you everybody for that one. Uh, we'll go on to the next poll, which is, um, and that's good to know. That's really that's really interesting, and will be informative during the session. So, where are you in your data vault journey? So we had quite a few responses on this previously. So I uh, accidentally left the poll open. <clears throat> Great, it's so fairly early. Uh, lots of interest, learning. Um, Neil, where does that? How does that compare to, in terms of your experiences around? I'm, I'm actually really encouraged by this because Data Vaults um, had some issues with with marketing aware market awareness over the last few years. I think increasingly people are beginning to hear about it um, and are curious as to what it can do for them. Um, it's not for everyone. You'll find that out later in the slide set. Um, but it's good that it's really encouraging that people are interested and want to learn more about it. So um, that's great news. And hopefully um, by the end of my talk, we'll uh, have people even more keen to learn about it. And uh, we'll give you some pointers for further learning resources. Fantastic. Great. Good. So they've come to the right place. Mm -hmm. And the final question. This is the final one. So you won't be taxed beyond this. Um, what is your view of data modeling? And I think probably that question could be slightly more expressive. How important do you think data modeling is in terms of um, managing data? Okay, that's good. So I think there's a consensus, more than a consensus. I'm glad the bottom one wasn't chosen. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they're just being polite. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I've been to other meetups where I've had that kind of um, um, feeling expressed that uh, if we can avoid doing data models, that would be great, or data models were something we used to do 20 years ago. Um, mm. Unfortunately, I think nowadays they're becoming more important as you're um, being held accountable for knowing what's in your data um, for uh, GDPR or, or uh, other data protection reasons. So, um, you know, you do need to model data to understand it. And I, I agree. Great. I'm really happy. Oh, no. Who did that? Is that there's you? Always, there's always one. There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Good. So, Neil, without further ado, then, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay. Um, to kick off. Right. So, if this goes well, your screen should appear. Yeah. You've got half That's an hour. You told me. Yeah, I've got half an hour, which isn't enough, really, to do data vault. Well, just. You, you, you know what, Neil? If you need to overspill, we've, we've got time. So uh, that's all right. I, I mean, what I'm going to do is is uh, I always produce fresh slide sets for every every session I run. So the the good thing is it's all fresh. The bad news is I haven't rehearsed it properly. So um, I think it's going to take me about half an hour to get through this material. Um, if I take uh, slightly longer, apologies. If I take slightly shorter, you've got some more minutes left back in your life. Um, we've, so, we've got 50 minutes, so neither the sample time. So if you need to go, that's 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 okay. Good. I'm just joking. <laughs> I should be fine. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, oh, I'll actually skip forward. Uh, so uh, yeah, you give me half an hour to do it. Um, I'm going to sort of skip over the top of Data Vault and explain how it fits into into the uh, landscape of our architectural options. Um, I'm repeating the slide you showed me earlier. So um, uh, yeah, let's skip over that one. So really, if I've only got half an hour, um, I haven't got time to go into all the technical details of how the data vault behaves. Um, I can only reintroduce some of the topics today and give you an idea of the scope of what the method is. Um, but uh, there'll be a plug here at the very end. I'll give you a link. Um, and I actually do run free two-hour webinars on, on the details, more detailed uh, dive. Um, and I'll provide the link at the end of the, the session, which you can join. Um, and there I'll go into some more details about how the mechanics actually work. And it's free, so um, no, no charge or anything with that. It's just limited places. OK, so um, there we are, Handsome Devil presenting today, Neil Strange. Um, I'm the director of um, a company called Data Vault over here in the UK. That's our web address, datavault.com. My email if you want to get in touch with me. Um, and long, long time ago, um, I graduated from London University in, in physics. And I've been in consultancy ever since I graduated uh, in IT and management consultancy. 
And right now I'm the chairman of the UK Data Vault user group, well worth checking out, because there's lots of downloads from there available for you. And I specialize in Data Vault 2 data platforms. Right, a um, little bit about context. Um, so the world today is moving really fast. And it's the rise of uh, the data consumer, the data scientists. And um, what they really want is good quality raw data. Not really care much about how it's produced. They're not interested in, in data pipelines and architecture and so on. Just good quality raw data to get on and do the data science with. But there's problems. You know, produce some results. And if something goes wrong, then you get the interrogators arriving. And they ask questions like, why did you choose that data set? What made you think that was appropriate? Um, and if you've made a mistake, can I actually trust any of your results at all? Tell me why I should. So that means really that um, there's a vested interest for data scientists to have a well-engineered data pipeline. Um, and um, that means they can then assure their customers that the results they're producing are correct. And um, in today's um, world of, of um, regulation, you can't leave that uh, uh, to trust. You've got to prove and have evidence that the pipeline works properly and that you have the right answers at the far end. Part of the reason is, um, particularly in financial services, the managing directors effectively signing off that they trusted the data when they did their risk analysis on the business. And if they get that wrong, um, then there's some liability attached to that. So what is Data Vault? Well, there's many ways of describing it. Um, I prefer this one, which is it's an architecture, basically, an architecture. It's a way of building a data platform. Um, it works across a whole set of technologies. We've built them in, in, in Hive, in SQL Server, even MySQL at the bottom end, Redshift, Snowflake, um, and, and Google uh, BigQuery is possible. Um, it's particularly popular in regulated industries um, and others. Uh, um, it solves a lot of the problems you face as your organization scales up and becomes more mature in the analytics area. So um, what happens when we use Data Vault? What sort of things change in your organization? Well, Data Vault's really good at uh, generating ETL. So when you, uh, when you use it, you find that your teams, your data engineering teams, are spending far less time Writing, uh, writing SQL, writing ETL, and much more time uh, analyzing the data and writing metadata around it. And I'll explain how that works a bit later. Um, it also means they can focus on unusual cases, business rules and so on, where their input it actually adds value. What happens to the teams? Well, your, your teams tend to be smaller, uh, made up of more, slightly more senior people who can work in, in multiple areas. So I've seen team, seen organizations with maybe 40 people in their BI uh, area. Um, they end up at the end of that with maybe seven to 11 individuals. So quite a, quite a significant reduction in team size. Um, Data Vault also is agile. Um, so it supports iteration. It supports refactoring. It supports a lot of the good things that, that uh, agile uh, project approaches bring. And that's not possible in, in uh, data engineering for warehouses. Um, it's quite good at handling mistakes. So if you make a mistake in Data Vault, um, you can refactor your way out of it. Um, I've uh, got clients who've got uh, old traditional data warehouses and they have to spend a lot of time uh, checking out uh, deployments before making them because reversing them back out again is quite painful. So um, handling mistakes is really good in Data Vault. It's a lot of it's metadata driven. So you'll be working with um, abstractions about data. And um, it's an architectural approach. So you'll find that there's a layer model that you'll use for uh, loading data and then rolling the data out for, for consumption. But who's using Data Vault? Well, um, actually, I've got a number of clients who are secret about it. They won't actually let me tell you who they are because they see that as a weapon in their industry. But here are some uh, of the more commonly exposed ones. Um, a lot of these are American focused. Um, Sainsbury's has added to the list. They, they publicize that they're using Data Vault for their large program that they're working on. But these are old projects. You know, who's using Google, Google BigQuery? Well, I can't give you any names, 
Um, but what I can tell you is that there are some out there that are using it. So um, our more traditionally minded clients tend to be at the moment working with AWS and Azure, and um, they're increasingly looking at the Snowflake database. But um, in the last two or three weeks, I've had a number of phone calls from companies that were looking at Google BigQuery, including an insurance company from Canada. I had a team from Accenture call me who are developing um, a new product, analytics product, which is going to be underpinned by the data vault architecture. Um, and there's a SaaS provider who got in touch with me who's adding features for an analytics layer to their, uh, their product and have a team working out in India um, working on that. So there's quite a few coming through. But I'd say that they're relatively new um, in, in terms of uh, a platform. When you're working on, on, on BigQuery, how does that actually differ um, in when you're building out other, other platforms? Well, the thing about Data Vault is um, you actually find that the, the common plan, the common architecture works across all kinds of technologies, including Google BigQuery. So it's very much a similar architecture that you would deploy elsewhere. But there's a couple of caveats in there you need to remember. The first thing is that the, um, the data vault itself, the, the, uh, the engine, is used to hold um, a data at, with integrity and auditability that reflects the raw data in source systems. When you come to have users accessing that data, you expose a separate data set to them, a curated data set taken out of the data vault. That means that your users don't actually access the data vault directly, they access a derived subset of it. And it's that subset that you can tune and make uh, uh, appropriate for the particular technology that you're using. So if you'd like to have a big table uh, there, then go with that, or a star schema if you want to build those out, or even build APIs for uh, micro front ends and so on, you can do that as well. That's entirely possible. Okay, so users access that presentation layer rarely data vault directly, or sometimes you can give access to your data scientists who uh, have a little bit more sophistication on the SQL to get the data out. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, context for today. What, what, whatever method you choose has got to be able to satisfy a number of use cases that are coming through in the business. So um, first one of which is um, what uh, is called the data desert. Um, and now Bill, Bill Inmon shares a really good story here, um, which I'll try and summarize really quickly. Um, and that is he talks about an energy company that decided to get into big data and analytics. So this is back in the old days of, of in-house Hadoop stacks. So they bought a, a rack. They spent a lot of time setting up a Hadoop system. They loaded in all their energy usage data from customers. And then they ran analytics on it. And at the end of a very expensive project, they discovered that uh, customers use more energy when it's cold. Now, the reason for that was they didn't join the data to anything. They weren't able to analyze what those customers look like and different behavior of customers. And the point he's really trying to make is that unless you integrate data from different sources, you're missing out a lot on uh, the analytics that you can perform all the various uh, comparisons and grouping functions you perform on the data science depends on having a bit of variety of data in there. So some data may be large, but it may actually not contain very much information. So you need to be able to integrate to get uh, analytics out. Yeah, you've all seen this. Uh, data is growing, growing faster and faster. Um, but what it does mean is whatever you build today in terms of a data platform may be 10 times bigger in five years. And the last thing you want to do is to go back to management and say, hey, I, I built something a while ago, but it, it can't cope with the growth. I'm going to have to throw it away and start again. Um, and the data vault is particularly good at scaling. It goes up to, um, it goes up to a petabyte scale. Mm -hmm. We've got a 40 petabyte uh, a system already running with, with data vault, um, and it performs quite well. So build it once and scale up rather than having to throw away. Yeah, of course, we've got all the financial regulations coming in, Basel, Insolvency 2, and so on. And that's a really big focus on audit, um, integrity, and trust. Um, data Vault builds that in uh, as part of the, uh, the standard data patterns that we use. So you can always find out where data came from. You can do integrity checks to prove that the data is accurate and complete, um, and a, re a reconciliation to show the correctness of the data. So if you can do it for finance, why not bring that into other organizations, other industries. 
is a good practice. Uh, yeah, data protection, PII. Well, some companies say, I'm just not going to load PII data into my warehouse and then realize actually at some point you're going to have to. So you need to have mechanisms that allow you to, to uh, shield or um, obfuscate data and hide it away. And um, Data Vault has ways of techniques of doing that by hiding data in protected schemas um, and also hashes um, a lot of the uh, primary keys where um, you may have hidden uh, uh, PII data in there. So it provides mechanisms to, to get around some of the GDPR requirements. Yeah, we're all uh, going to have an Internet of Things or be driven down this route with uh, lots of sensors out there, edge devices and edge computing involved. So you need to be able to plug these things in. Um, data Vault has a mechanism to uh, allow real time load uh, on, on the data, uh, which you can do to, to, to network with your uh, Internet of Things uh, devices. Uh, data science, you're all uh, familiar with this at the moment. We're actually seeing this becoming a mature practice in a lot of organizations now. So not only are you doing data science, but you're having to plug your results back in to the operational uh, part of the business to help support decision making or even to drive, uh, drive business processes. Um, that means that you need to be able to take data out to research things. You need to, be able to train your models, operationalize them, and then monitor them and tune them um, or even redevelop them as they uh, become um, as the business moves on and maybe makes them irrelevant. So you need to be able to access data and use data uh, for that cycle and even feed data back into the platform, uh, which you can use for uh, analyzing the performance of that of that model. Yeah, all that's possible. Now, finally, uh, well, not quite finally, almost finally, the ability to handle unstructured data. I always find unstructured really is a bit of a, a misnomer. All data has some structure in it, uh, even if it's only metadata. Um, so you may have video data, sound data. What, what, what should you be doing with that? And to get data into a platform, you really need to be processing it to generate structured insights out, which you can then feed back into the integration we talked about earlier. So, um, uh, data Vault can allow you to store the metadata, the structured insights, and also pin the unstructured data files to the structure to uh, provide access to raw data if you need it. And oh yeah, all these are nice, exciting things, but don't forget the old traditional reporting still there. And according to Gartner, that traditional reporting is still 85% of the load that's placed on a data platform. So you need to make that as routine, regular, and automated as you can. Uh, while still be able to support those 15% of use cases that uh, look at um, innovation and insights uh, on, the, uh, on that data set as well. So data platforms have lots and lots of users out there, lots of use cases to support, and has to remain as a sort of general service that supports the, the business needs. So when it comes to our clients, um, they choose uh, Data Vault because of those reasons. It supports those two use cases. Um, and um, the features here, flexibility, uh, it has a slight hybrid architecture, so it's structured um, as well as uh, unstructured data can be held. It provides that audit and lineage tracing, it's scalable and it supports automation. Um, so that, that's, the, that's why it's, it's popular. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna do is to make this a little bit more real for you, we're gonna talk a bit about a case study. Um, I've made up a company called Hypo Furniture. And um, they, um, basically that, that company's got uh, sells furniture, or manufactures furniture, uh, and it's a growing business uh, fueled by acquisitions, which means it's, it's buying companies uh, with databases um, already running in their, in their organization. And we need to be able to integrate that data into a, an overall view for the business. And, and for that reason, they need a flexible data platform. So projects being created, to uh, build a new agile data platform capable of incorporating that data. And they've gone down the, the cloud database and storage route. They've chosen, uh, say, Google BigQuery to do that. And um, you know, it's a, we have typical systems out there. We've got CRM systems, order management systems with, with structured data in there, tables of data that will be filled in as the businesses go through their operational uh, data, uh, sorry, operational tasks. And um, our, our platform's got to start uh, bringing data together and analyzing that. So 
how do you solve this? Okay, Data Vault's one solution, but um, I rarely actually come across a client um, that volunteers to do uh, to build complicated solutions. I'm not saying Data Vault's complicated, but if they can get away with simple approaches, that's what they'll try first before moving into a more structured way of working. Okay, so you're often on this maturity journey from the left-hand side. So new companies, when they start up, have a few use cases in analytics, um, maybe three or four systems to work against, tens of tables in each system that they're interested in, and so on. And on the right-hand side, um, we have our large corporates that have hundreds or thousands of use cases and dozens of systems and from seven to 70 developers out there. So the solution that you, you, uh, you need to keep in control of the, uh, the, the, the reporting um, varies as you're on that, on that maturity journey. So let's take a look at the left-hand side and see what uh, a lot of companies do. Uh, click on that, right. So um, they tend to build very simple direct reporting. Yeah, they have a source system out there with a database um, and they uh, use reporting menus or queries on that database to extract data directly into dashboards or, or spreadsheets. So you might see, for example, Power BI or Looker being used here uh, to build a pipeline for a particular use case. And that's, that's good, that's fine. Then you add more, and you add more, and you add more, and you end up with some governance problems, inconsistencies, lots of repeating activity on that, and um, a, a, a bit of a mess to unpick. Now, I have seen some clients with 750 or more pipelines running and big charts on the wall showing how all these uh, pipelines are working. Um, but, but you really do need to start looking at a sort of structure in there to, to, help, uh, to help manage that volume. OK, so those are the sort of pluses and minuses on that. Now, in history, the um, two traditional ways out of that mess are to go for star schemas invented by Ralph Kimball and Bill Inman with his operational data stores and enterprise data warehouse approaches. Let's, let's just quickly drill into those and I'll show you how those work if you've not seen those before. So what, what Kimball basically said was, okay, we've got all these uh, source systems, transaction processing systems, but they're not really optimized for reporting and um, they even delete historical data so we can't uh, fish out historical data to compare year on year. So what we really need to do is to introduce a new layer he called that his data marks or cubes. Um, and he built uh, a cube for each uh, use case. So you might have a profit and loss analysis, a customer churn analysis, customer service analysis cube. And he'd feed data from these source systems on a regular cadence, on a, on a batch basis, maybe every day, into those cubes. And you then build up um, um, some analytics that you can then plug your dashboards into. They're really good, they provide slice and dice functionality, um, and they work. Then what happens as it grows, you find that your cubes start to grow in number, and you have to start uh, conforming some of the, uh, the data sets across these cubes. So you might have a conformed dimension of customers or a conformed dimension about products, so that uh, wherever they're used in the cubes, they, they represent the same, the same level of granularity in data. And as you can see on here, yeah, there's lots of crossing lines. However, they're very quick to produce, and very quick to value, and actually quite intuitive for your end users. So they're, they're, really, quite, they're really quite good. Uh, one of the minuses though, as the volumes go up, the, um, all those crossing lines and the governance around them becomes a little bit difficult. And you have to invent new types of star schema to manage all the types of data you have to manage. Okay, so that was Kimball. Um, what Inman does, is basically builds a middle layer to gather data together and then pushes the data out to cubes. Those cubes can be Kimball star schemas. In fact, uh, Inmon recommends Kimball to use for that. And um, what you have there is an integration point in the middle. You see there's far fewer crossing lines, but you've got to build that layer out in the middle. It's an additional layer of work to be done. And in the old days, um, that would possibly take months to put in place before you could get real data out on the reporting side. So um, you've got a balance here. Inmon has a slightly less uh, complex set of crossing lines, Kimball value quickly, 
that has problems is, is it scales. OK, there are other methods out there, uh, which I can't really get, I've got time to go into. But so uh, basically, Dan Linstead arrives um, sometime in the 1990s that says, hey, how about a data vault? What I'm going to do with data vault is borrow some ideas from these other two methods. So then the one's got some great ideas. But I need to jazz that up a bit, make it a bit more agile. And I like the star schemas. Um, but let's uh, use them for end user analysis, uh, data consumption part, rather than building out the, uh, the storage layer. So he built a, a hybrid, That's the way I look at it anyway. I'm not sure Dan would describe it as that. Um, and basically, they all borrow an influence from each other. OK, so why was he doing that? Well, Dan was working in, um, in a client in the defense industry, even back in the 1990s, that needed to process petabytes of data. Um, with strong auditability and lots of different consumers uh, of that data with different needs. And of course, back in that, those days, that's a really challenging architecture to deliver. Um, so storing petabytes of data and querying petabytes of data with the database engines at the time was a real challenge. So to do that, he had to come up with an architecture that was kind of uh, uh, emphasized uh, parallelism and minimized the processing of raw data. Uh, and offered integration by the topic that was needed for the consumers and provided traceability and auditability through, through the use of metadata. And he carried on working with that, that method, refining it and refining it and refining it um, until he published uh, the first uh, 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 document about it in the early 2000s. Okay, in 2015, uh, he updated the version to method to, to version two. Uh, to improve its scalability and to, um, uh, to extend the method to cover recommendations across the whole software development lifecycle. And it's still going, uh, undergoing continuous improvement at the moment with, a, with an active user community. Okay, if you want to learn about the method, there's a book out there. So um, it's a book uh, which is open source is the method, so you don't have to pay to learn about the method apart from paying for the book. Um, but one warning there is this was published in 2015, and um, some of the methods moved on a bit since then. But it gives you a really good introduction to the method. It's very thorough. It's over 600 pages. Um, it gives you lots of examples of how to use SQL Server with SSIS to build a, build a vault. So well recommended. Go and buy it. I even have a copy here. There you are. That's my personal copy. So uh, I use it as well um, as a reference document. Okay, so get back to our use case. We want to build out a data vault then uh, with, um, with the data that's coming in. Okay, so here's our data vault. A uh, little bit looks a bit like the Enron uh, architecture. We've got source systems coming into an integrated view, which is the data vault, uh, raw data vault area. And then we're pumping data out to marks for consumption by uh, managers or analysts, or whoever needs to use that data. Okay, so let's build that system one step at a time. So the first thing we need to do is we have to stage data, bring data in uh, and stage it into a, a staging layer to allow us basically to move uh, from the source system technology, which might be SQL Server or whatever, into, uh, into Google BigQuery. So staging, bring it in. Um, it's a transient layer. So um, if you're running batch, you bring a batch load in every time and then truncate the staging table again before loading the next batch. So it's a uh, it uh, only holds the current uh, data set for loading. OK, so we have our source system. Remember all these tables? And we're bringing them into our staging layer, uh, one staging table per source, a source table. So here we've got one, two, three, four, seven tables. We'd have seven staging tables on a batch load running on a cycle. OK, so having brought that in, we then have to move that data into the data vault. And the way I think about that is the stage table um, organizes source data by, by source, yes, by source table. And when we move it into the data vault, we're pivoting that data, and we're going to break that data out by business topic. So business topic being things like customer or order. So we're trying to split the data apart and assemble data around those topics to allow it easier to, uh, to access the data for downstream use. OK, um, in there, we've got these things called hubs, links, and satellites, three types of table that we use to model and express the data that we're trying to load. We'll come back to those in a moment. OK, so what's a hub? 
So Hub's a business concept, which is a significance to the business, and they exist in their own right. And effectively, a hub is a list of business keys. So customer, order, product. We have a hub customer, hub order, hub product. And the keys for customer would be your customer ID, the order ID, and product ID or product name will be the list in there. Okay. And what we're doing is we're going to be mapping the stage data across into those hubs. Now, if you look in those details, so if, for example, in order, the order table, we have some information about the order ID. We also have information there about the, the customer ID. So the order feed would allow us to populate keys in the customer and order tables. Yes, the contact CRM ID would be a uh, customer, customer ID in the customer table, and so on as you go across the, the structure there. So you can see I'm mapping, I'm starting to break data out from the source into target concepts. Now, hubs usually only have four columns. They're very narrow, very long table. Um, quite right, they're just a list of the keys. So if you look in the content there, the lines, we have a customer ID on the bottom there. We have some metadata, a load time and a record source that provides auditability for us. And then a PK at the top, which is a hash of the customer ID. And that means if we're in GDPR land and customer IDs assumed to be um, uh, PII data, and you can drop the customer ID column off of that, that uh, hub and just have a hash in there. And you can even sort that hash to make it difficult for people to re reverse engineer uh, PII uh, information from uh, outside. So that gives you um, a, a framework there of concepts to hang your model off. Next thing you look at are links. Um, links are just there to show you that uh, hubs are related for some purpose. Now, and that they could be related because there's a structure in there. You, know, you have to put them together to make an assembly, or they're the same thing, so the same as type link. Or we have a transaction or an event that's happened in the business which draws in one or more hubs as part of that, part of that event or transaction. Okay, so. Links uh, typically only have five columns. They're very narrow again, very long tables. And all they do is they point out to the hubs that uh, are involved in the event, uh, load date, time, and record source as metadata, and they create a primary key, which is, again, the hash of the foreign keys involved there. If you look in that, you can see um, it's, it's quite narrow, and um, it links that together. Let's, so let's move on. OK, so we have. Source data coming in, we've mapped uh, hubs from it. We can also map the link information. So if you look at the order table there, the green order table coming in, we have an order ID, customer ID in there as columns. That explains that the order and customer are linked together uh, for placing an order, and therefore there's a link created for that. Okay, those arrows above don't mean anything in terms of the, the destination. They're just to indicate that uh, the data is populated from the green tables. I think finally we look at satellites. So satellites where we put the actual payload information in, um, and they're used to connect to hubs or links, uh, but not other satellites. And um, what they do is they record point in time values. So if you have a, for example, a customer record being fed, and that customer record details change, we hold um, we hold the history of those changes in the satellite as fresh records stacked one on top of each other. Here's an example, customer, customer payload coming in stored on a satellite, and that satellite describes the hub record, the customer record. There's some metadata at the top there. Okay, and there we've got some information about times. Um, there are two time stamps recorded when we loaded the data and when it was effective in the business. And that gives us some bitemporal data, so we can ask the question, what did we know when? OK, so that's it. We're mapping uh, source data to uh, a data vault uh, a structure made out of hubs, links, and satellites. Here's a big picture of that. Um, but what's actually going on here, those, those are like, like standard Lego blocks. So we've actually only got three types of data here, hubs, links, and satellites. OK, and they form like a grammar to describe the business that you're analyzing. But it actually ends up standardizing your model into, into three types of table. And that helps us generate loads later. 
Okay, we now have to get data out. So we now need to get data out into Marts, and um, that's all business driven. So you uh, you want to interview your users about what they need in terms of analytics or your data scientists. You then analyze the data that they require. You link that back into a reporting layer schema, which could be a star schema or a big table or whatever you want to build. And then you link that back into the, uh, the vault, uh, build the ETL to populate those, those tables, and then put your dashboards off that. Now, one of the advantages from the data vault is that the, um, if you're going for a star schema, the fact and dimension tables are possible to build those using views on the the uh, data marks on sorry on the data vault structures. Um, so uh, producing star schemas is really fast um, out of that out of that data set. Okay, um, so when you do this, uh, your uh, alert data architects have a couple of questions. Okay, the first thing they say is okay. So we had four source tables and we ended up with twelve target tables. Doesn't that mean we're going to have an explosion of tables everywhere? And the answer to that is, well, yes, but no, really. Um, some rich tables will, will explode into a lot of tables, but that's because they hold a lot of denormalized data. And then when we normalize them, it starts to break the content out across the model. The other thing, of course, is that we're going for automation. So uh, when we automate, they don't, the automation generator doesn't care how many tables there are out there. And um, actually also, in, when you look at the mapping, quite a few of the source tables don't map to more than two or three targets, maybe a hub and a satellite, or a hub link and satellite in the combination. Second question that's asked is, what about all these joins if I have to navigate around that model to, uh, to get data out? Um, that's often a query right at the beginning of using Data Vault, but the more you use it, the more you realize that it's not really a relevant question to ask. It's rarely an issue with the, with the clients that we work with. And partly the reason is that end users don't access that layer. They access the marks. So um, they're not continually thrashing the, the links. Um, also, um, the, um, there are techniques in there that provide helper tables called pits and links, which um, allow you to support a really rapid access using views on the, the data vault to support the reporting layers. So performance is rarely an issue when we deal with our, with our customers. Almost there. Um, this is the big secret source, really, of Data Vault. If you think about it, we've identified three tables only, hub, link, and satellite. So I don't think you'd be surprised to find that the SQL for loading those tables are very, very similar. In fact, what you can then do is, is convert those loading patterns into a template, templating language, and then just generate the SQL um, based on the metadata, the mapping metadata. And when we do that, we find that we get uh, much faster development, uh, far, far uh, less problems with data quality and, uh, sorry, quality of uh, coding and much more consistent loading. Um, and don't get me wrong, we, the performance improvements here can be really, really substantial, 500%, 800% improvement in productivity on the teams when we do this. Okay, so just to conclude, um, that's the data vault. Um, it's evolving all the time. These are some of the topics that, that are talked about at the, in the user communities around uh, data vault. So there's a, there's a big uh, drive on getting real-time loading working. There's a big drive on getting Kafka hit, hung up to it and running with Kafka. Um, integration with sort of Lambda and data mesh techniques. Um, uh, there's a lot of tools out there now, an increasing tools market, uh, providing you with uh, the generators and diagramming tools you can use with Data Vault, and, and so on. So um, well worth uh, joining in and, and working out from the community about what's going on. Uh, so if you want to learn more, um, I have a free course on Data Vault Core Concepts, which is a two-hour course. So only join if you're really interested. It's a small group live webinar presentation, so I allow about 10 in at a time. There's a link here on Eventbrite. If you go to Eventbrite, um, there's a number of, uh, of courses in there um, over the next few weeks waiting to be filled up. We've already filled the first three courses uh, up, which is great news so far from uh, early marketing. Um, please join that, and if, if courses start filling up, 
I'll continue to add new ones to the end uh, until we uh, until we manage to satisfy all your needs. So please join, add your name to wait lists, and we'll carry on from that. And then um, just to let you know that I have a paid for course coming up, uh, but it's for Snowflake and um, working with DBT. Um, and that's a three day course, um, which is uh, close to finishing, but um, it's in the famous 90 percent complete state at the moment. So I'm being beaten by my training manager to get this finished. Hopefully that will be out soon. Um, and uh, finally, uh, do come to the UK user group data vault uh, website, www.ukdatavaultusergroup.co.uk. Uh, we advertise new uh, meetups on there for us, and there's a whole set of downloads from previous events there. And it's advertising also a new event that's coming up on June the 9th at one o'clock in the afternoon UK time. And we have John Giles joining us from Australia, who's a good, well known author on using data architecture in an agile way. And he's got a whole set of stories to talk about and case study on Data Vault. And that's it. Um, and we have also free material on our website, datavault.co.uk slash what is data vault. And that's it. Thank you very much. Back to you, Imran. Neil. Is he awake? He's awake. Yes, I just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Neil, for that really informative uh, talk. Clearly, lots going on in the lots data vault world. Um, and it's exciting to hear there's so much traction. Um, uh, with uh, different data providers, consultancies, uh, companies taking it up. Are there any, um, Neil, in your opinion, are there any particular industries that lend themselves or have affinity uh, towards using Data Vault, or would you see it as a more generic? Well, look, I, I think, I think what, it, what it is is no company is going to volunteer to build extra uh, processing and functionality in if they don't need it, okay? So there's a lot of startups out there that really don't need this sort of uh, this sort of extra governance. Um, they're, they're very much happy with reporting directly from source systems or building a, a small data lake in place to hold source data. But I, I think you'll find as your um, as your business grows and the governance overload, it starts to build on that, that you need some kind of structured approach in there. And that's where Data Vault really comes in. Um, right at the moment, fi finance companies like it because of the uh, audit trail that you get. But there's plenty of other things in there to like as well. And um, one of the things I would say, because it allows you to build and scale, if you think your business is going to grow, um, have a go at a data vault. You can build a small version of it, and then it's there. You don't have to throw it away and start again if, you're, if your business outgrows the, uh, the data platform. OK. OK, great. Um, Neil, what I'm going to do is go through a few slides very quickly. Yeah, okay. sure. Big query perspective and dive into the questions. I think it'd be great to see. Yeah, there's quite a few coming in, and I'll see if I can uh, answer some of them. I've got a, a long list here. Okay, yeah. good. Carry on. Smashing. So I am sharing my seat, uh, screen. Um, it will just be a few slides to delve into, briefly delve into the big query side of things. Um, so, one thing to call out is that there isn't anything specific about implementing uh, Data Vault and BigQuery over, over and above any other SQL based analytical data store. But there are some uh, considerations and native features wow. of BigQuery that we can uh, potentially leverage when using um, um, uh, when implementing Data Vault. So, um, for starters, a, a very high-level conceptual view of a pipeline. So, mm -hmm. split into three categories. I think from a data engineering perspective, there's um, as Neil, was, as Neil mentioned, um, you're introducing a new concept, new data structure into your data model, this ensemble of uh, hub links and satellites. So these are sets of tables that um, that uh, need to be uh, considered. And um, that would typically be below your presentation layer. So this is um, something which um, actually I... Um, one of the things I did actually, did actually was uh, look at a, a use case of mm -hmm. uh, uh, of a data vault on BigQuery. So as a, there's a really good, a very succinct, and I think quite an excellent article by someone called Daniel Zagelis on Media on Medium um, that I've um, taken some of these design points from. Highly recommend people uh, actually have a look at that for a, a quick read through on, on someone's hands-on experiences of using. Um, implementing data vault or playing with data vault on BigQuery. So some of the things that come across are, um, and this extends, extends itself from um, 
Neil's, uh, Neil's talk is that data governance is important. Understanding the relationships, the uniqueness, the attribution between different entities is going to be um, pretty important in, in terms of um, implementing data vault. If you don't have that right, it's going to surface in uh, it's those kind of um, any Not mis- the though, is it? It's it's a it's, it's a common requirement now coming in. Yeah, so it, it, it is common requirement. But would you would you say Neil that given um, the particular way, and this is a question, given the particular way that Data Vault is um, is um, um, structured in terms of these interconnected tables, the relationships and particularly the relationships on the joins. Yeah. Uh, do uh, directly link to the quality of the data. Yeah, I would say, I'd definitely say so. That that's that's the case. You you you, ha- you um you do a little bit of analysis on the data to build the, the that um, ensemble layer, um that allows you then to to get all that all those governance and traceability features in on that. And actually, um, occasionally, what I do is I uh, I build um, analytics out of the data vault itself to generate uh, governance analytics, and then feed that back in on itself like a reflexive model. So I actually have a data vault with the raw data in it and, a, and then a, a layer on top of it or just built on top of it, which is the governance view. And then you can feed your governance management uh, data relevance about quality, about um, issues in the data that they have. So um, that can be quite can be quite useful. Nice. So a great virtuous circle there in terms of governance oh, yeah, and, um, and um, actually implementing a um, building out your data vault. Um, the focus is on inserts rather than updates. So every uh, table will um, be will have the uh, low date on there. So that's mm-hmm. that goes back to um, the whole um, point of auditing and um, and traceability. Um, being able to determine the latest record and again really falling out of that, the ability to identify differences over time and actually track and analyze changes over time and really pinpointing uh, point in time. Uh, view or analyses of uh, of your data. That's, and, actually, that's quite a key point. Um, yeah, sorry to keep jumping in, but then and I have some, some clients who basically, uh, uh, with their with their legacy systems, they they delete data or they process it and throw away the raw raw data. Um, and sometimes they um, they have real trouble reconstructing history. Uh, so they they build in calculations as part of the load that gives you some historical comparisons, and then another manager comes along and says. I know you've got data about three months ago, but what about six months ago? What about a year ago? Can I flex this, please? And the answer is, oh, no, I can't do that. We've thrown away the data. So um, Data Vault uh, loads all the raw data and gives you that, that history as well. Awesome. Absolutely. And Neil, do you think it's um, do you think customers are missing a trick in terms of um, organizations are missing a trick in terms of maybe not analyzing the changes or the uh, behaviors of certain entities or transactions over well, a period. It, may, it may well be. It, I, basically, I think we could ask data scientists that. That would be a good quiz question to ask. Um, well, you know, if uh, if you knew what you knew when um, and you could model that behavior um, versus what you know now, um, what would be, uh, would that be a use for you? So, um, you know, organizations, for example, they restructure quite frequently. So do you want to know what the organization chart was like uh, a while ago or versus now, particularly if you're looking at maybe sales performance, if your sales organization has been reorganized a few times, how do you compare old and new hierarchies you know, for roll-ups? Or uh, what if we, um, we have some uh, you know, changes in geographical area and stuff in terms of the way we work, or we change, have new ways of categorizing our customers, new ways of segmenting them? Uh, what, how do they behave under the old and new segments? Um, that sort of thing will be preserved inside a inside a data vault for you to uh, play with and ask questions with at your at your leisure. Great, great. And the final point I, I'm making here is um, that um, so within data vault you're relying on hash functions to generate surrogate keys, and BigQuery supports a uh, a variety of hash functions natively out of standard SQL. That's fine. You don't have to do that. It's uh, that's an optional feature to to hash. Um, so there are ways of running data vault without hashing. Um, okay. It's a good practice to do that because it obfuscates data, um, but you don't have to. Okay. Great. Good. Um, so uh, one final point that uh, Daniel makes in his article, and Neil would be interested to get your thoughts on this, is that he doesn't he feels that data vault, the core data vault schema isn't suitable as a reporting layer, and mm-hmm. therefore you still need your data marts or your 
star schemas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't forget, um, data vault will be used in larger organizations with lots of reporting needs. Um, and for security purposes, you really ought to cut the volumes of data down and curate data sets for particular use cases. And that's what your marks are for. They're um, subset of data that's, that's supplied for a particular usage. Um, if it's then a cut down, it's faster. Again, it's more secure, so you can hide data that people don't need to see. And you can optimize the presentation at that point for what they need on, on performance. Absolutely. Yeah. They may not be interested in the history. They may just want the latest version, in which case you can just give them the latest versions. Yes. Yeah. And and you made a great point on security. So within BigQuery, data is typically secured at a data set level. Mm -hmm. So that's a completely different way in terms of requirements and the view that the business needs on the data as opposed to what the data engineers are doing in terms of standing up the um, core data vault. Yeah. So that said, I'm going to jump to the questions and get through as many of these as we can. Um, Right, so let's go with some juicy ones. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, if the current architecture involves raw, involves raw staging and a dimensional model, um, are there any benefits of building a data vault in the middle? So I, I guess this goes back <laughs> to the point of the talk. Uh, well, um, carry on um, with that architecture until you start having governance issues, really. Um, it will scale up to a certain amount. As soon as you start having these governance issues in the middle or, um, or, or cutting data in different ways, then think about um, a data vault at that point. But, uh, um, or alternatively, uh, start gradually introducing it now in, in anticipation of having problems coming in. Um, so you can do it in a small incremental way. But um, yeah, you, you, uh, if it's working well at the moment, don't change it. Great. Thank you, Neil. We'll go down from the top, actually, in terms of uh, yeah. most rated. So, this kind of ties to the uh, whole presentation layer. What is your recommendation as uh, for a semantic layer when using BigQuery? Would you use materialized views, uh, pros and cons? Mm, good question. Um, I'll probably duck out of this and I'll give a, a dummy answer. It's, uh, it depends, I guess, on the size of the data set um, and how much assembly you're doing from the data vault to query-wise to get the data out. Um, so um, all kinds of different technologies are out there. Start, we, we often start with um, regular views um, because they're more agile. You can, uh, you can change a view, a column in a view. You know, you could have a meeting with a, with a customer, uh, a end user of your system, and they say, oh, can we please add another row or two, another column or two to your, uh, to your star schema? If you do that and you've got a materialized view, it's hours before the data is available for them. If you've got a standard view, by the time they're back at the desk, you can have that, that available for them. Um, uh, so you move to materialization if there's, a, if there's a performance issue, really, on that. And um, Neil, in, in all fairness, I think there's um, big query nuances to that question as well. So yeah, sure um, there is. You go ahead. Yeah. there's considerations without going into it. There, there'll be considerations in terms of how uh, what the traffic is on that view. Yeah. What is the underlying? Um, so cost is a consideration to the big query so what is the what is the uh ex the effort in in generating the results here from that view and what you know what's going on in the underlying query and how that links back to big queries costing and um mm -hmm. the way big query organizes data so um i would say all of that neil and also yeah. the standard best practice that you would consider from a big query Query well, actually, it's like, I mentioned earlier that I haven't gone into the details of, but there are things called pit and bridge tables, which um, do a lot of pre-calculation for you to avoid having to repeat expensive queries over and over again, which you can use to help you um, on there as well. So views on those are often used rather than the direct data vault itself. Yeah, yeah, and there's, cache, and there's caching options also with BigQuery. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. So moving on then, um, you are using ETL to load, to load both data marts and the data vault. What is your take on using ELT instead? Uh, it, is, it is effectively ELT we're trying here. Um, the, um, there's no real transformation on the load of the raw vault. Um, uh, all we're doing is splitting data up to it, where it should go in terms of the data model. So we, we load raw data, the raw data that comes in. We, we do transform later um, after we've loaded the raw data if we need to provide business rules on top so to calculate derived values. Um, and we may use transformations on the way out to the marks as well, but we try to postpone the transformation bit uh, as late as we can on the pipeline. 
So essentially we are ELT with Data Vault. It's ELT into the raw layer, and then we will do some other transformations after loading, yes. So it's it's probably um, ELTTT as the uh, way we do it. Thank you. Does Data Vault support slowly changing dimensions? Yes. Yeah, um, so Ken Graziano has written a whole nice um, article on how to generate a type two slowly changing dimension with a single query running on Data Vault. Um, I'll, maybe you can find a reference to that. So straight out of the uh, straight out of the vault. Great, good. Do you face problems with Cartesian products when you query the data vault, and how do you deal with it? Um, well, I deal with it by making sure my developers are awake, basically. Um, so you should test test what you're doing. Um, what we have is um, there are because we've got these effectivity dates in the in the data model. You'll be checking that the data that you're uh, you're querying is is in range for the date that you're querying against. That stops some of that, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's usually a mistake if a, if a developer's doing that. You'll know because the query first time you run the query, it runs for hours. <laughs> um, once you've got it tuned and working properly, the data will come out uh, come out smartly. So I suggest you you still you still continue to wrap your um, ETL with tests. Make sure you're yeah. not doing. And I guess this also ties back to the point of data governance that you need to know and be on top of your data quality and and um, That's it. business. Um, so basically, Cartesian products shouldn't happen um, as part of the, the querying. Okay. And, uh, there's quite a few questions on this data vault session, 9th of June. Get a bit confused oh, about because it hasn't happened. Yeah, it's, on, it's, on, um, it's on Eventbrite. Um, I didn't put it on the slide. Um, so. Uh, yeah, there you go. There it is, the meetup.com UK Data Vault user group. Yeah, that's it. Good. Yeah, um, I can provide that as a note afterwards. Sorry, I didn't put it on the slide. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. If the current architecture, uh, now we've done that, uh, does Data Vault support traditional OLAP type workloads without needing a dimensional model? No, uh, you need to put it out into an OLAP queue to make that work. Okay. Is uh, okay. Is, is Data Vault more an operational data store? Um, um, not really. I mean, we're 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 actually breaking data up. Sorry about the motorcycle in the background. We're breaking data up by topic here. Um, so um, that means it allows us to integrate data more for integrated reporting, uh, getting it out to the marts. Um, my take on operational data store is it's mostly for for source system specific reporting. Um, I could be wrong on that in terms of my interpretation, but that, that's how I view it. So um, uh, not really. It's a bit more than an operational data store. Yeah, I'd agree with you there, Neil. Um, my understanding of an operational data store is it's literally a copy of your load from your source system. Um, yeah. Free changes. We, we split it up by topic, and we joined it together with other data. So um, by the time you get the data out, it's a bit more value add to it. OK, great. So here's an interesting one, um, probably one that will be of practical interest. Can you migrate ah. uh, into a data vault from a denormalized yes. schema? Yes, and it's really, uh, really quite a neat technique. Um, if you remember, I talked about hubs, links, and satellites. Um, what you can do is you can pick a table in your denormalized data set and build a link out of it into a data vault structure. Yeah, so you can start building hubs and links and using the link to connect to something that's there already. Um, so it means you can start with a legacy system and build out from it. That means you don't have to re-engineer all the old stuff to get new functionality working. That's quite a powerful way of working, a sort of hybrid way. And then if you like what you see, then you can start to gradually re-engineer your, um, your legacy into a data vault structure. But you don't have to do that straight away to get value out. Great, thank you, Neil. Yeah, here's a good one. <laughs> we're going to talk about BigQuery. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, and hopefully the, what we've talked about will allow you to directly relate the sort of different design considerations yeah. to what you need to be thinking out, thinking about at a... I think I said about this early on in the slide set, actually the architecture works across all the technologies and even the people have called me recently. Um, they've been adapting Snowflake SQL into BigQuery without any um, modifications and it's working fine. So um, um, it's one of those genuine architectures that seems to work wherever there's a sort of relational concept. And Neil, I believe you are developing 
in the late stages of developing, releasing a tool for BigQuery? Yeah, we have a, we have a, it's like a free to use tool um, based on the DBT um, data engineering tool. Um, and it, uh, it automates the generation of SQL for um, the data vault. It's a, uh, I, I call it, it's not a, a, for end production use really yet, you can use it for that. Um, but it's a quick and um, free way to get into uh, understanding data vault. Unfortunately, it only works currently with Snowflake. Um, but I will tell you that two of my uh, customers, two of the people on, on Slack um, uh, that are using it are already porting it for BigQuery. And we hope to bring that in uh, fairly soon with a, a BigQuery uh, version of it. Any timelines there, Neil? Uh, I can't promise because it's something we do in as an extra task. And if we if we have lots of customers demanding my developers' time, they, they have less time to work on the product. But uh, they are um, they're working on it in the background right now. Um, we've just put in the multi uh, multi platform um, dispatch in there, so um, uh, we'll be able to plug in other technologies as well fairly soon. Great, thank you, Neil. We've gone over the hour, so yeah. I'm going to try and wrap up as quickly as we can. Um, how does BigQuery perform with uh, using hash keys in Data Vault and Data Mart layers? Um, I don't know um, because it's uh, it's a fixed width. Um, if you're using hash, it'll be a fixed width hash for uh, for the key. Um, I can tell you how it performs in other other platforms. Um, it generally isn't an issue as long as you're not breaking the page width in terms of the the size of the data width the data width of the column. So um, if you're using an MD5 hash, you've got a 32 character or 32 width or 16 bit width um, key in there. Um, and um, that usually performs quite well. Great. You go up to the higher end hashing, then it can be more of an issue if your keys to 156 characters wide or something like that. Mm. So down to last two, um, is this useful for, for this being presumably data vault for product analytics? Yeah, um, has been used for that. Great. No Final question, seems like building marts from a data vault require lots of tables, joins and different queries, correct? Um, yes, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's the right level for a, a normalized view of your data. Um, so if you're coming at it from this point of view, you really want to count tables and joins and stuff. I'd, I'd say don't ask that question. Look at the value you're trying to drive and look at what you're trying to achieve on integration first. And if you find that you need integration, you'll end up with this number of tables anyway, whatever, whatever path you take. And you know, Neil, I think that goes back to a really uh, important point from a data engineering tooling perspective that um, probably some level of automation would be helpful. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Once you scale up, you do need automation. As, uh, otherwise, you'll be um, manually juggling all this, and it's just too much for, it, for you to keep in your brain or to juggle on a spreadsheet. So you'll get to a certain size, and then you'll, you'll need to use a tool, a diagramming tool, and a generator for it. Now, some of my clients have built their own very successfully and others buy an off-the-shelf package. Okay, okay, great. Um, <clears throat> we've got a, quite a bit over the hour, actually, so I'm going oh, to yeah, eight minutes. hear uh, Neil. So firstly, thank you, Neil, for joining us and uh, giving this really informative, interesting talk on, on Data Vault. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that, and uh, be really. I look forward to um, yeah. hearing at all when it um... looking forward to seeing all these guys on our meetup and please promote it because john giles deserves a big audience um he's a really good presenter really nice presenter from australia um and he, he's got some really insightful views on how to do agile architecture data architecture awesome so that would be of interest i think to any data practitioner yeah. so that's the data vault uk meetup on the 9th of june Thanks. June 1, 1, 1, 1 p.m. Uh, UK time. I had to try, try to pick a time that worked for Australia and the States as well, and there isn't that much of a window in the day for it. That's quite a spread, isn't it? Yeah, so, um, yeah, definitely encourage everyone to, to do that. Um, these slides will be posted um, on the group, so if you want to see Neil's, um, refer back to Neil's training um, uh, opportunity, then uh, I highly encourage that. So with that said, thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Neil. Have a great Thank evening. Much, guys, great week. And uh, until next time, adios. Bye-bye. Bye, Neil. Bye-bye.